oxygen. In other words, 15,000 times higher than usual. By the evening, the level has shot up to 600,000 times above normal. Boulevard Lenin, 200. Boulevard Lukaina, 250 milli Ranjans. And that night, seven Ranjans. My subordinates were starting to wonder if the machines were working properly or was someone lying to us. We did not know that the reactor was still burning and radiation was still spreading. This map is sealed in plastic because it's still radioactive. It's thought that a human being can absorb up to two rongens per year without being affected. But the body is lethally contaminated if it receives over 400 rongens. During that first day, the inhabitants absorb over 50 times what is considered to be a harmless dose. Such a pace, they would have received a lethal dose in four days. To understand what is going on, the colonel sends a patrol to take the first readings at the base of the plant. Their first readings were recorded on this map, 2080 Rangens. I was worried about my subordinates. How could I send them in there? At these astronomical levels, 15 minutes is all it takes for a human being to absorb a lethal dose of radiation. At the Nuclear Institute, the figures provoke a shock. Such a level of radioactivity has never been seen before. Gorbachev hurriedly creates a governmental commission made up of the country's top experts in nuclear energy. This is led by the academician Legasov, a nuclear physicist of international renown. He immediately leaves for Chernobyl at the head of a scientific delegation. We hoped they would be able to evaluate the situation quickly, but for the first couple of days, they weren't able to tell us anything. It was a dramatic situation. We'd be in session, waiting for information. We were demanding information, but they weren't able to tell us anything. 20 hours after the explosion, the level of radioactivity continues to climb. By now, windows and doors should be sealed and iodine tablets swallowed to counteract the effects of radioactivity. Yet no such orders have been given. Despite rising tensions in the city, the population has still not been informed of the situation. Yulia Marchenko was only five at the time. She lived in Pripyat with her family. Her father worked at the plant. My parents took me to the daycare center, like usual. Everything was absolutely normal. My father already knew there'd been an accident, but no precautions had been taken yet. 30 hours after the explosion, the first security measures are enforced. More than 1,000 buses have arrived. At 2 p.m., the army announces the city is to be completely evacuated. I remember the teachers at the kindergarten gave us iodine pills. Then parents came to pick up their kids. Everyone was running around, but they weren't panicking. We thought we were only going to be gone for three days. To avoid any panic, the authorities conceal the seriousness of the situation. Inhabitants are given two hours to gather their belongings and assemble in front of their buildings. They told us to get in the buses. I remember perfectly well having to choose which toys I was going to take. I had a lot of dolls and wanted to bring them all, but I couldn't. We couldn't even take any warm clothes. People have to leave everything they own, their entire lives behind. They will never return.
One old man didn't want to go. He stayed behind. They found his body a few weeks later. People didn't really believe what was happening. They thought they were being lied to. They remembered the German occupation and said that in 1941 there were bombs that fell. But now there was nothing. The elderly people didn't believe in an invisible enemy. And there was no time to explain. My soldiers and I were simply carrying out orders. In three and a half hours, 43,000 people are evacuated tearfully but peacefully. Buses carry Europe's first atomic refugees. They have been exposed to doses of radiation that may alter the composition of their blood and engender fatal cancers. Вот я сейчас смотрю напротив стадион. Здесь должны дети играть. Ну, без риска, без, по-моему, нигде нельзя. Forty-eight hours after the disaster, the only people left in the ghost town are the military personnel and members of the scientific delegation, headquartered at the Pripyat Hotel. As if unaware of the danger, they eat, sleep and work right on the premises. These were upstanding people, specialists. I couldn't believe they would do something irresponsible or suicidal. No, it meant they'd underestimated the situation. The old criteria were no good anymore. There have been nuclear accidents before, in our country as well as in the US, but that information had been kept secret. There had never been an accident of this scope. They even thought the reactor would be back in service by May or June. Meanwhile, clouds filled with radioactive particles are being blown north by the wind. Between the 26th and the 27th of April, they drift over 1,000 kilometers above Russia, then over Belarusia and the Baltics. On the 28th, they hit Sweden, where the rise of radioactivity is detected near one of their nuclear power plants. Soon after, television news alerts the population. Radioactive dust from Chernobyl rains down on Stockholm. The authorities send a squadron of fighter planes to take readings in the clouds. The level of radioactivity suggests there's been a major accident somewhere. 60 hours after the disaster, still no official word has been reported outside of the Soviet Union. The uh, Swedish Minister of Energy phoned me on the Monday and I was in my office in Vienna and she told me that they had measured very much increased radioactivity near our power plant in Forsmark in the east of Sweden, and uh, they had concluded that it must have come from abroad. Did we know anything about it, was her question. And we said that no, we did not, but we are ready to contact and uh, others, and we contact the Poles, they didn't have any nuclear power plant, but um, if there was anything else that could have happened there, and we contacted the Russians, of course. What has happened? An explosion? A radioactive cloud? Serious contamination? It was Sweden that alerted us. Three days after the accident, while Gorbachev is still trying to gather data, American and European spy satellites turn to the Soviet Union and discover the ruins of the Ukrainian plant. The smoke, wafting from the gaping hole, shows up clearly in thermal vision. 